Well, I'm going to skip uh, a slide or two because I'm, uh, I'm a professor, so I, I could talk for a long time. And I'm going to say that is, that is where the data stops. Now I'm going to make an argument, and this is the argument. When two proteins have to bind together, like several chains of hemoglobin or the many different proteins in cilia, why do they bind together? The reason they bind together is because their physical surfaces are complementary to each other. These are supposed to be two proteins that have complementary surfaces. And the chemical nature of the contacting groups has to be complementary as well. And it turns out that typically you need a number of different, five or six different uh, contacts on the protein surface in order to get two proteins to bind together. And each of the proteins, each of the different, some of the proteins are repeated many times, but each of the different kinds of proteins in a machine like this, in a machine like the psyllium, they all have to have complementary surfaces that cause them to stick together. <coughs> I'll skip this one here. Uh, additionally, they don't just have to stick together, they have to assemble themselves. In our everyday world, machines are assembled by people or, or by machines that have been programmed to do so. In the cell, machines have to assemble themselves. And this is a, a little essay from the journal Nature of uh, two years ago saying that the ability of cilia and other machinery to spontaneously assemble themselves in the uh, cell, it's as though cars could be manufactured by merely tumbling their parts onto the factory floor. This is not a negligible part of biology. The ability of proteins to stick to each other specifically and with enough force is crucial uh, to their properties. Uh, and here's just my little foray into philosophy. Uh, 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 Thomas Aquinas was quoted by uh, Cardinal Christoph Schoenborn a few months ago in the journal First Things. And Thomas Aquinas compares uh, biology to shipbuilding <coughs> and says, well, it's the same thing. Nature is, is, uh, just, technical, is just technology, but that itself assembles. And so we can tell, essentially, that there's purpose behind this because the, uh, the uh, parts of life assemble themselves. Well, Thomas Aquinas didn't know anything about the psyllium. Uh, but the more and more deeply we go into biology, the more um, compelling uh, this self-assembly uh, needs to become. <coughs> so uh, the argument I make in my book, which I'll just state here, is that the ability to get two protein-protein binding sites is beyond what we would expect from random processes. And yet, in a typical cell, there are on the order of 10,000 protein binding sites. And if you look at the data, uh, and this is data from those studies I talked about, there was only one protein-protein binding site uh, developed by random mutation, that's the sickle cell site. Even in 10 to the 20th malaria, we did not get uh, such a thing. So I argue that <coughs> the limits of Darwinism, the search for the limits of Darwinism is, is uh, the limits of Darwinism are very strict. That is, that Darwinism explains much, much less of life than I would have thought a decade ago. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, I argue that design extends much, much deeper into life uh, than uh, I would have thought then, too. Okay, let's, let's just skip over that. Let's skip over this, too. Um, okay, well, proteins, who cares about that? Uh, just biochemists. Uh, but most people, when they think about evolution, think about giraffes and elephants and dinosaurs and so on. Large animals. Um, and here's a relatively large animal. This is the fruit fly Drosophila. And a lot of work has been uh, uh, done in the past decade or decade and a half onto how complex animal bodies like this arise from the interaction of proteins and, and genes. And just skipping over it briefly, the answer is it isn't easy. Uh, just with everything else, the more and more we know about it, the more and more complex uh, it turns out to be. All these names here are different protein parts. 
And this uh, almost like electrical or computer diagram is the interactions that are necessary to build one particular tissue in one small animal. Um, so because of the need for multiple steps to set this up and the coherence of the system, um, I say that there are good empirical reasons uh, to think that design extends at least to the level of vertebrate class, that is fish, birds, and, and so on. Uh, I would bet that it extends much deeper, but that's as far as our, as our uh, evidence uh, takes us so far. Okay, um, so that's what I say. Uh, but I, I was really surprised and flattered to find that almost concurrently with my book, a number of reviews of it uh, have been published. Uh, uh, some by uh, 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 major scientific journals. For example, the journal Science uh, published a review just la last uh, week, a, a two-page review by a very uh, prominent scientist by the name of Sean Carroll, who's a, 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 an evolutionary biologist. And uh, we shall say he, di he did not like the conclusions uh, of the book. Um, well, let me just review very briefly uh, a couple his chief reasons for, for uh, not liking the book. First of all, he says, my chief er error is that I minimize the power of natural selection to act cumulatively. That is to say that one change is good, next change will make it better, and next better yet. <clears throat> Furthermore, that there are examples of this cumulative selection, including something called pyrimethamine resistance, which is a drug used in, uh, against malaria. And I omit this, and uh, a notable omission, so kind of insinuating that I'm avoiding data that, that doesn't fit with the thesis. Well, I'm confused about this because on page 75 of my book, I talk specifically about pyrimethamine. And I say that, I say specifically that uh, the first mutation grants some resistance, adding more mutations uh, and can increase the level of resistance. I talk about exactly what he says I'm not talking about. So I, I'm, I'm just uh, confused. Uh, he, he must have something else in mind that, that he didn't put down on paper. Uh, additionally, I talk about other examples of cumulative mutation. I talk about a hemoglobin called hemoglobin C. Harlem and say that developed exactly the way uh, Darwin envisioned by numerous successive slight modifications. And I also say in the book that random mutation is the perfect tool for the evolutionary job when steps are continuous and close together. That is when you can accumulate mutations. But then I go on to say that, well, if they're not, then it's a problem. And I go on to argue that that is, in fact, the case. So uh, I, I um, I'm don't know what Professor Carroll's thinking of. I, I do speak about exactly what he, uh, he wanted uh, spoken about. And then he goes on to say that my further argument about protein-protein binding sites, uh, he does not think uh, holds water. As a matter of fact, he says that what I argue is beyond the limits of Darwinian evolution actually is within its demonstrated powers. It's demonstrated. We already know that it can do those things. Uh, and he reiterates, it has been demonstrated that new protein interactions and protein networks can evolve fairly rapidly and are thus within the limits of evolution. But if you actually go and read those papers, it turns out they are not demonstrations. They are comparisons of protein sequences between different phyla. They have different sequences. They have different interactions. And the authors ascribe them to Darwinian evolution. And that's the problem, uh, not only with the authors there, but with Professor Carroll and, and many Darwinists they read into the data their theory. They say, this happens in this organism, this happens in that organism, therefore it must have happened by Darwinian processes. But when we are asking about demonstrations, this is a demonstration. This shows that in an enormous number of opportunities, no such protein-protein binding sites did occur, and that the production of them is a whole lot more difficult than I think Professor Carroll um, uh, is uh, is, uh, is um, recognizing. OK, uh, let me say that this is the end of the biology. In the final chapter, I go off the deep end, um, if I haven't already. Uh, and I talk about kind of philosoph more philosophical matters. And I especially talk about how these, the results in biology fit like a hand in a glove results 
from other scientific disciplines such as physics and cosmology which point to the fine tuning or give evidence of design of the universe for life. And this is supposed to be a picture of the Big Bang, uh, which we now know has to be very finely tuned to allow for a universe to produce life. And it's been called uh, the Goldilocks universe. Can't be too hot, can't be too cold, has to be just right. And this is a very lively topic. Just last year in the journal Nature, our universe outrageous fortune uh, was an article talking just exactly about that, about how the universe is balanced on a knife edge uh, to allow life to occur. Furthermore, if you read in the philosophy literature, which I try not to do, uh, you see, I hope there are no philosophers here, uh, that in fact the fine tuning of the universe, uh, two possible explanations are usually envisioned the design hypothesis and essentially the multi-universe, infinite universe hypothesis. And I, I uh, talk about that in my book, but let's look at the design hypothesis for a second. And the fine tuning, what we have discovered uh, as science has learned more and more about the universe, and just like the cell in the 19th century, the universe was thought to be pretty bland too, pretty simple. But now we know there are finely tuned laws and constants, but more than that, we know that there are finely tuned properties of chemicals. If water wasn't just what it is, we'd be in big trouble. If carbon wasn't what it was, we would be in trouble. Furthermore, there are what I call finely tuned details and events. And let me kind of skip. These are books that talk about exactly those things, uh, recent books. Uh, let's just look at the finely tuned origin of the moon. These days, astronomers think that the moon arose by something looks like a serendipitous process. Some Mars-like, Mars-sized body hit the nascent Earth. This is supposed to be the developing Earth. Notice that the, the arrow isn't pointing right to the middle. It had to hit at a certain angle. If it didn't, it wouldn't work. And that was just the right angle to produce our moon. Turns out without our moon, life on Earth would be history um, for various reasons. And as uh, astronomers, or as uh, Peter Ward and uh, Dan Brownlee discuss in their book, Rare Earth, which argues that our Earth is probably pretty close to the only one in the universe that could support life, uh, the getting of that moon to, uh, from this collision is a very finely tuned event. My point uh, in the last chapter is that <clears throat> many people think that the laws of the universe were finely tuned to permit life, but kind of want to leave it at that. But if you leave it at that, there's a good chance that that asteroid, or whatever it was, might miss. What happens if you have a great gravitational constant? You have a great charge on an electron, just right, but the, 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 uh, the asteroid misses the Earth, and now you have essentially a barren planet where the Earth should have been. Uh, so in order to produce life on Earth, you not only need the right laws of physics, the right properties of chemicals, you need the right events to occur, too. And I make the same argument for the origin of life. The origin of life is, continues to be unexplained and a real, a real uh, stumper. Um, it's, it's hard even to find a good hypothesis uh, for the origin of life. And the astronomer, or the physicist, Paul Davies, uh, wrote in a book about seven years ago, that the problems are so great that it demands some radically new ideas. And my idea, radical and new, or something, uh, is that we can envision the origin of life as just another finely tuned event, kind of like the, the production of the moon from that collision. And we can envision the changes that occur in biology as more and more and more and more finely tuned events. I know this will strike a lot of people as strange. It, people, it, this is not often an idea you hear, and I develop it in more length in the chapter, but don't have time to go into it here. So here's the picture that I'm uh, kind of trying to paint here in the final chapter. We go from very general laws of nature to more specific, like properties of carbon, to even more specific, like uh, the origin of the Earth and Moon, 
to into biology, into cells, into molecular machinery, into more specific uh, types of biology classes.